We welcome you to worship this morning. We're glad that you're here uh, to, on this beautiful summer Sunday in July. And uh, on the uh, organ and piano accompanying our worship is, is not Ernie Orsel, like normal. Uh, not an 82-year-old woman, but an 18-year-old man, uh, Bobby Sheridan here, our worship intern. He's on his way to Indiana University here uh, in the next few weeks. So this is kind of his last gig in this year of, uh, that he's been serving us in all sorts of ways. Uh, he's going to fill in for Ernie for the next two weeks. So we give thanks. Why don't you stand and sing? Our first hymn is uh, f hymn 532, Gather or Sing. this place the new light is streaming now is the darkness vanished away see in this space our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day gather us in the lost and forsaken Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now, and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your faith. Have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the proud and the strong, give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters. Call us anew to be sought for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place the new light is shining, now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Give us in all peoples together fire of love in our flesh and our bone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let us pray. Creator and sovereign God, you have ushered us into the kingdom of heaven by the death and resurrection of Jesus. By your spirit that lives with us now, may we have your wisdom to be people of peace and justice and mercy in the days you are on earth. We pray this in the name of 
Jesus, who has revealed your love to us, God. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. We have uh, children that we can invite forward for a children's sermon. Do we have children? We have Adam, our family minister, who's going to do it. Oh, there we go. Hey, we got the grandkids out here. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, sir. All right, I'll let you go at it. All right, well, good morning. Yikes. Good morning. Thank you. So I, I, I told the kids at 930 a little secret about me, and I want to let you guys know a secret also. Is that okay? Okay. You, gotta, you, you can... You can tell everybody else later, so it's not really a big secret, but it's something really cool. I'm super smart. And so, <laughs> so you guys can keep that in your heads and just know that about me. And so I'm, I'm super smart. I have a lot of books on a shelf and, um, that I've looked through and read. Um, I, I've got a lot of, have, you have two? Oh good, we're in the same. We probably have the same books. Um, a hundred, I know. We've probably read similar books. And so, um, but I know a lot of really good things. So we have all this knowledge. And you guys are super smart too. You have all this knowledge. You know that you're not supposed to cross the street without a parent, right? Right. You know you're not supposed to maybe play with fire, right? That's a bad thing. It's dangerous, right? That's dangerous. Um, it, but he was with you, right? Okay. And you set a fire in a safe place. And so, <laughs> right? Um, and so we, we have all this knowledge. We know that we shouldn't touch a stove maybe when it's on, right? Yeah. We also know. Definitely because, like, Which definitely because I have a um, power on, like, a really, really hard one. Oh, okay. could melt your skin. That would be a bad thing. So I also know that an apple is healthier than a candy bar. But on the other side of things, I also know that sometimes a candy bar is a little more fun to eat. Yeah. Right? But I also know, and this is where we learn about a word called wisdom, I know, wisdom's a really tough word, but what wisdom really means is I know how to make the right choice. And that's what God helps us do. God helps us to make the right choices and to give us wisdom. So sometimes we have a lot of stuff in our brain that we know, but we don't know what to do with it sometimes. So we have to listen to God and listen to what our heart says to do too. And that's where wisdom comes from. So as much as I would love to eat this candy bar and eat all of these all the time, like at Halloween, right? You get all that candy. Yeah. Sometimes it's smarter to um, just eat something healthy and I, wait to eat all of this. Can I tell you something? Of course you can. <laughs> they did. Yeah, and I was like, can I just have one peppermint? That was their wisdom. Yeah. And so. <laughs> So, our wisdom is all about how we use the things we know to make good choices with our hearts. Sound like we can do that? All right? Yeah. Let's pray real quick. God, we thank you for your love and the knowledge that you give us and the wisdom to do the right things in our lives. Help us to always act in the way that makes you happy. Amen. All right. We have Miss Sally downstairs for Sunday school. If you guys want to come down with me and we'll do some Sunday school. Cool? All right. Let's go.
a reading from 1 Kings. At Gibeon, the Lord uh, appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept him for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you and no one like you shall arise after you. The word of the Lord. Let's stand and welcome our gospel this morning. <laughs> This morning is from St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. And in our lesson today, we have Jesus teaching a number of parables all about the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it becomes the greatest of shrubs becoming a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. He told another one. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had to buy that pearl. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when the net was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good fish into the baskets, but threw out the bad. So that it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out, separating the evil from the righteous throwing them into the furnace of fire, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? Jesus asked. And they answered, yes. And then Jesus said, therefore, every scribe who has been trained 
for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> so as you've learned in numerous sermons that you've heard, when I got out of college in 1985, I became a high school history teacher, uh, teaching at Central Catholic High School. Uh, I had turned 21 in August, uh, and I became a high school history teacher about two weeks after that. So I was a, a pretty young teacher, which when I taught American government full of seniors that were 18, I was full of anxiousness because I was so close in their age, but much more comfortable when I taught for, uh, world history full of freshmen, 14-year-olds. And in my world history class, I had a group of boys that were led by Brian, and they were uh, destined to be popular boys in high school, right? They, they had all those boxes you need to check in high school. They were good looking, they were athletic, they were smart. And the neatest thing for me at 21 as a teacher was that they liked me and they thought I was cool, right? They, they called me Mr. H. I kind of imagined myself, you know, as that kind of hip teacher, right? And, uh, and, and it hit all my buttons because I didn't check any of those boxes when I was in high school. So suddenly it's like I'm popular now in high school. And uh, in that class, there was a, uh, a, a nice and, and, and pleasant and, and, and pretty girl named Marissa. And, and Marissa, for whatever weird algorithms of high school, didn't check the boxes that she needed to become popular. She was, she was somewhere else. And, you know, and it, it makes you think, right, that high school is maybe that first time, but not the last time, that we're in a place where we get labeled and put into a box and, and, and we can't get out of that label, right? Where someone has distilled our complex personalities, our gifts and, and brokenness and, and, and said, you're this and then you're that. And, and for Marissa, she was labeled an airhead. That's, that's what she was labeled. She, she, and, and she got this label because she had a penchant for, for raising her hand in the midst of class and, and, and interrupting the flow of what was going on and asking a question that seemed like it came from nowhere. And, uh, one that I can remember was she raised her hand and said, Mr. H, Mr. H. That's what they called me because they thought I was cool. Mr. H, what, what, what? The, the princesses in Egypt, do you think they wore dresses that were silk or linen? I don't know, Marissa. That's... And Brian in the back of the class would slap his forehead and go, airhead, and then everyone would laugh at Marissa, including me, because I was the hip popular teacher. <laughs> So really, that's the end of that story, because I honestly have no idea whatever happened to Marissa. I, I only taught one year, I changed jobs, uh, moved out of the area, and, and I never ran into Marissa again in my life, never heard about her or what's happened to her. But I was thinking about her because in a sermon a few months ago, I shared that I was labeled as a class clown and I had a teacher that stood up for me in the midst of class when the Brian in my class slapped his forehead and said, Hamf, you're an idiot, right? And Mr. Barton told him I wasn't, told him how smart I was. And, and that small affirmation became kind of this precious gem when I was 14 that I that I held on to, and over 40 years later, it's still important for me to think about. And I was thinking, you know, Marissa doesn't have a Mr. Barton moment for me. I, I hope she had one from one of her teachers, who was a little less enamored at being popular and caring about others instead. It, it feels like a weird place to start there when I'm going to talk about wisdom today. <laughs> because if you were reading that scripture that Jim just read so excellently in, in worship here, if you're reading the Bible, there would be a bold uh, headline that said, Solomon receives God's wisdom. 
Because it's a famous text. And this is... And wisdom was a thing in the Bible. It was a thing in, in the time of the Bible. It was a pursuit of people. And, and, and the basis of the pursuit is that we are trying on earth to align ourselves with God and God's values and God's hopes. That wisdom is being aligned with God. And as you know with your car, if your car gets out of alignment, then, then it kind of eases its way off the road and suddenly you've got bumpy uh, tracks ahead of you, if not dire consequences. And, and that's the idea behind wisdom. If we don't obtain God's wisdom, our life gets bumpier, if not tragic. And so Solomon, before he becomes king, asks to receive God's wisdom. To align himself with what God hopes. In fact, the, the language in scripture that's there, I think it says to understand or, or something like that. It, it, the actual language in Hebrew, I'm told, is to listen heart. To listen with my heart. To, to have wisdom, to align yourself with God is to listen with God's heart. To see with God's eyes, to feel, or to listen with God's ears, to, to feel with God's heart, to see with God's eyes. To empty ourselves and, and have God pour God's self and God's priorities into us. But it's hard to empty ourselves, isn't it? <laughs> Because every day we walk into all the situations and all the encounters we're going to have and all the decisions we're going to have, and, and, and we carry our own experiences into those, who we have been and, and, and what we feel like we need. So at 21, I am still a kid that longs to be accepted and popular in high school, and that becomes my greater need in that moment, rather than God's hope for me. In that classroom. And Solomon had great needs too. If you, if you read scripture, then, then you know that Solomon becomes king not because he's the oldest of David's sons. He's not the oldest. He's, he's third or fourth or fifth down the line there. And the reason he's becoming king is because one dies and then two of them kill each other. And there's a sister that's raped. It's an ugly, ugly Old Testament story. And Solomon's kind of the last guy standing. And he becomes King, And so he comes into that kingship, and you can hear it in what Jim read today, full of anxiousness. I, I'm not a military leader like my dad or Saul before him. I, I, I'm young for this job. No one's expected me to take this position. And in that anxiousness, he asks to be emptied of all that anxiousness and be filled with God. Filled with God's heart and, and eyes and mind and scripture tells us that God gave him that and, and, and you think that God like opened up and poured in all this knowledge to him because that's what we think about wisdom isn't it right that it's all these things you need to know and, and actually to know how to rule like God hopes is all over scripture and it's easily known. The prophets talk all the time about what a good king should be. A, a, a good king that would have God's heart would be a king that is a servant king. Rather than a king that expects to be served. A good king that is aligned with God's needs and God's hopes in the world would be a king that makes Israel more faithful. Living into the covenant. That can be described just quite simply as loving God and loving neighbor. A good king that is aligned with God's scripture is a king that is going to pay attention to those on the margins. The prophets are always lifting up. How are the widows and the orphans and the aliens, the immigrants in your midst, how are they doing? So it isn't so much that God pours God's wisdom into Solomon on that day. It's that God opens Solomon up so that God's priorities can become his. And scripture tells us that Jim read today that he became wise. And, and 
Uh, and there's all sorts of evidence of that in Scripture. He, he wrote that book of Proverbs, which is a, a book of pithy wisdom sayings. He, uh, he was known for his wise sort of justice that he wrote. The very next uh, story after this one is the very famous one where two women are fighting over one baby and and, and Solomon wisely figures out how to do that. There's the famous story of the Queen of Sheba coming from thousands of miles away to, to, to witness this wisdom of Solomon. We know from history that Solomon became a, a, such a powerful ruler, making this very small country a player among nations and making Israel stronger than it ever was in its entire history. And First King seems to tell us that because Solomon asked for wisdom and received it, he became this rich and powerful king. But you know, the wonderful thing about Scripture is that the characters in Scripture are rarely just black and white like that. They're always much more gray. So if you read all the chapters that have to do with Solomon, you find out that he amassed all sorts of wealth, and lavish living, and the prophets that were associated with him worried that what was happening with those who were living in poverty that the servant king was supposed to be paying attention to. If you read all of the chapters, you find out that he had a, a knack for finding foreign wives who had foreign gods who brought them in in order to make foreign alliances and increase his power in the world. But those foreign gods hurt the faithfulness of Israel. If you read all the stories of Solomon, you find out that maybe his biggest mistake as king was he didn't prepare this empire to live beyond his reign. And when he died, months later, his sons weren't prepared to follow in his footsteps. And Israel broke in two. And God's hope that this nation would be a light for all nations was dimmed. Wisdom. You know, from Solomon, I, I, I learned that it's not memorizing the book of Proverbs and all these pithy sayings. It's, it's daily being able to open ourselves up. And, and allowing God's priorities to trump our own <laughs> To leave our baggage behind and, and, and see the world as God sees it. To notice what God calls us for in that day. It's starting your day asking God to replace your heart with God's heart. Your eyes with God's eyes. Your hands and your feet with God's hands and feet. And it doesn't come with age. It comes by daily doing that over and over again and asking forgiveness when we have those moments with Marissa where we fail. So after I was a, um, a, a school teacher just for one year, I, I worked for 10 years and, and, and then I got back in kind of the high school business as a youth pastor. I was hired to be a youth pastor at a number of churches and I did that for 10 or 12 years and had uh, a number of different youth groups. And in one of those youth groups, towards the end of my time as a youth pastor, I had a girl named Shauna. And, uh, and, and Shauna had that same sort of label and box that Marissa had, that I had, this, this class clown, the, the, this airhead sort of thing. And, and, and Shauna's gift that she had was that she could tell a story that would make everyone laugh. And the stories were almost always self-deprecating and made us laugh at her, right? And so the one I remembered to share with you was that I remember once on Sundays when we gathered, she told us about a time when she ordered Chinese food and uh, her Chinese food had come cold the last time. So she told them to make it extra hot. And then she goes, and who knew that that meant in Chinese extra hot, it means spicy. <laughs> And my mouth was burned and it was horrible and oh my God. And I shouldn't say that PK because that's what they called me because I was cool. I didn't mean that PK, but gosh. So Shauna, what I knew about Shauna just by seeing her interact was that she wasn't just this class clown. There was just a lot there that she had to give in leadership and in smarts. 
So as a sophomore, I moved her into this leadership position. That's how I ran the youth group. I had four leaders that we met monthly with, that we planned out our Bible studies that we were going to have. We planned out our activities and worked together on our mission trip that would happen in the summer. And, and I elevated Sean into that position. And she was surprised. Everyone was surprised. And, and it went well. And then I moved on to other things, other churches, and, and I hadn't seen Shauna in a while. But unlike Marissa, I did get a chance to run into her. And it wasn't even that long ago. It was about 10 years after I'd seen her last, so she was like 30 years old. And I go to the Circleville Pumpkin Show, right, which is where all these Circleville people come back and, and, and enjoy each other's company again. So Paige and I go there, and I run into Shauna in the midst of this crowd on Court Street, with all these people around us, and, and we do the things that you would expect. We hug, oh my goodness, I hadn't seen you in a while. She's got a baby stroller, I meet this baby, and I hear about a husband, and she's an OR nurse, I hear, and all this stuff, and it was just this wonderful moment of catching up with someone that I hadn't seen in a decade. And as I'm leaving, Shauna says to me, you know, PK, I loved youth group because I always felt so smart in youth group. Right? Yeah. Wisdom is that opportunity that we have to receive from God when we just daily wake up and ask God to empty myself, Lord, of my stuff and give me your eyes to see your people like you see them and your heart to love your people like you love them. And when we receive God's wisdom, we not only become the best version of ourselves, we give our neighbor an opportunity to become the best version of themselves, too. Amen. Please stand and open your hymn note to hymn 793, Be Thou My Vision.
as God's people, let's lift up prayers. Holy God, empty each of us today and fill us with your wisdom. Align us with your hopes for the world. Share with us your vision for those we encounter in the day ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, we pray for the ministry of this church that your wisdom might be evident. That your concerns become our concerns. That we become a servant congregation sharing the love that we received by the actions that we do. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and ill this morning. We lift up especially Kimberly, Susan, Jennifer, Sherry, Karen, Teresa, Ziva, Mark, Sue Hendershot, Sue McClid, Mary, Charles, Joanne, Donald, Jean Fisher, Jim Keeney, Ernie Orso, Phyllis Baker, Roginia, Gary and Joyce, Robin and John Vanover, and others named aloud now. Lord, may we receive your love by a child of God full of your love with an abundance to share. All this we pray for, Lord, and whatever else your wisdom deems that we need in order to share passionately the grace and the mercy that we have received. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's love and God's peace with one another now. God's peace. Do you remember how to set the table? <laughs> God's peace, Rachel. <laughs> peace, Chris. God's peace, ladies. We have uh, special music uh, from uh, uh, Bobby on the organ and Tyler on the piano for this familiar hymn.
Why don't you stand? Let's pray. Holy God, Holy God, we have laid before you our best gifts, our gifts of talent and wealth, bread and wine, signs of our dependence on you day in and day out. Help us use these gifts, Lord, in your wisdom to share the love we have received. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection. Open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join this unending hymn. to us Jesus your son who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering preached good news to the poor and who on the cross opened his arms for all for remember the promise that Jesus made in the night in which he was betrayed where he took bread and broke it and gave thanks giving it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me and again after supper he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all drinks, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are proclaiming the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, so that we might be united to share this heavenly food with all we encounter in the week ahead, emptying ourselves and being filled by your very presence through this meal. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
may be seated while we finish communing our assistants that are up here. They'll bring this meal down for you to share. We'll commune those that are going to be communing in their seats today with this kits and all those worshiping with us at home. Okay, you put this on the back on that thing. <laughs> and you give this to that guy. <laughs> So for those at home, take out your communion kits. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The rest may come forward. If we have visitors today, please know that you are welcome. At this table, this is God's table. You're a child of God. So come and enjoy the presence of God that's offered in this meal.
Let us pray. Lord, fed and nourished at your table with your very presence, may we share now that presence by our actions, our words, our thoughts of love. Amen. Um, just a few announcements uh, before we scatter. Uh, the, uh, our, our family that we've been talking about, our uh, immigrant family that have come here uh, from Syria uh, after being in refugee camp for 10 years in Jordan, they are now on, uh, here in Reynoldsburg living and our, our, our um, committee is, is working with them and, and helping and serving and loving on them. We have cards for you to sign that Stacy will be out there. Uh, that she can help you to sign and welcome this family of four uh, as they uh, begin a, a new life in a new place. So I encourage you to stop and talk to Stacy on your way out to sign that code. Uh, we want to give thanks to uh, Bobby. I was, uh, I, I was talking to Ernie Orso on the phone uh, yesterday, and I told her that Bobby's uh, prelude was going to be the Phantom of the Opera. Which she goes, oh my. <laughs> so if Ernie is if listening right now at home, Bobby, you want to give her a few keys or chords of that? Well, as Ernie recovers at home, I hope that puts a smile on her face. Why don't you stand? We will have a uh, blessing before we scatter. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon all of you with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. Let's go. 